Thank you all for joining us for part one of our training series, Spectral Indices for Land and Aquatic Applications. My name is Amber McCullum, and I will be joined by my colleagues, Brittany Boudry, Juan Torres Perez, and Sativa Cruz throughout the duration of this training series. As mentioned, we have a fantastic RSET training team here for ecological conservation, and I wanted to introduce each of us with our photos as well. Since this is an introductory series, and it might be the first time you're hearing about RSET or taking an RSET training, I wanted to briefly highlight our program. RSET provides accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, and tools. We offer trainings in each of these thematic areas and have trainings from introductory level to advanced. All of our trainings are freely available and most are provided online to a global audience and remain accessible even after the series has ended. Some of our more in-depth trainings are provided in person. All of our trainings have materials available in Spanish and some even have live Spanish sessions. You can find more about our program here on the website listed. So now a quick overview of what you can expect in our training series. Spectral industry indices from multispectral imagery are extensively used globally to monitor landscape dynamics. And this is one of my favorite visualizations from NASA, where we can monitor things like the biosphere yearly cycle. I like to call this the breathing earth. And what this shows is over the course of the year, vegetation dynamics of NDVI, where in the summer, the spring and summer, you see green up and, and um, green in the Northern hemisphere and then senescence in the fall, where the vegetation dies down in the, in the winter. Um, and you can also see the dynamics of the ocean here um, with the chlorophyll as well. During this training, we aim to provide an overview of commonly used spectral indices for aquatic and land applications. We will discuss examples of spectral indice calculations with a diverse set of sensors, including Landsat 9, Sentinel-2, and the harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 datasets. For each session, we will also have demos doing index calculations using Google Earth Engine. Since this is an introductory training, we only have one prerequisite, which includes our fundamentals of remote sensing, which you can view here, or having equivalent experience. We hope that you can all achieve these learning objectives through the course of our three-part series. We hope you'll be able to recognize commonly used spectral indices in land and aquatic environments, distinguish between spectral indices to select the best suited for given landscape of interest, and compute spectral indices index calculations over appropriate areas of interest and acquire spectral index products from a variety of sources. So here we are in part one of the training where we will focus on an overview of what spectral indices are and we'll highlight the normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. In part two, my colleagues Juan and Brittany will discuss commonly used spectral indices for aquatic applications. And then finally, in part three, Brittany will highlight additional land-based spectral indices. Please note that we will have one homework that will be made available during the last session on November 9th. This will be a simple Google form that must be completed two weeks after it's posted by November 23rd. If you can attend all the live sessions and complete the homework by the due date, you'll receive a certificate of completion about two months afterwards. So please be patient. For this sec session in particular, first I will give an overview of the spectral properties of multispectral passive imagery, and then we'll discuss what is a spectral index. Then we will talk more specifically about the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, and I will identify a few um, NDVI data products, and then Brittany will um, provide that demo of calculating NDVI in Google Earth Engine. Please put your questions in the question box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. You can ask your questions as we go and then we will try to get to as many as we can after the webinar. If the questions are not answered during session, we're going to also have a Q&A document that we'll post on the training website 
um, about a week after the each session is over. So briefly, I'd like to first review the spectral properties of imagery, which will help ensure we all understand how spectral indices are calculated. For this series, we are primarily focusing on passive satellite imagery, which means that the majority of the data are collected in the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is the light that we can see. We all, satellites also collect some data in the infrared and the microwave portions, where our eyes cannot see. And the satellites measure reflected energy or solar radiation from the Earth's surface along these frequencies. So the reflected solar radiation is measured by the satellite in various wavelengths. Solar radiation passes through the atmosphere, hits a target such as a forest or water or building, and then those objects reflect and absorb energy in different wavelengths. This is a simplified example of what happens with electromagnetic energy for green vegetation. The figure on the left shows incoming radiation in the visible, so this is blue, green, and red, and the near-infrared wavelengths. B is blue, G is green, R is red, and IR is near-infrared. Blue and red wavelengths are absorbed by green vegetation, and the green and near-infrared wavelengths are reflected. This is primarily because of the chlorophyll in the leaves. So we see vegetation as green because we only see reflected energy in the visible wavelengths. We can see green, but we cannot see the infrared. Every surface on Earth, Earth reflects and absorbs energy in a different manner. For optical imagery, the sensors are capturing similar data that we can see with our eyes in the visible portion and then in the infrared and near infrared and mid infrared. So each object on the ground produces this unique spectral signature in each of these uh, wavelength bands that we are that the satellite is measuring. So here in this um, figure, you can see a typical vegetation signature in green that has a small reflectance peak in the green portion and a really high reflectance peak in the near infrared portion. Soil, alternatively, tends to have a steadily increasing reflectance value in the visible and, and near infrared. And then water in blue show, tends to absorb most of its energy. Therefore, the reflectance is fairly low throughout with a small peak in the blue. In this figure, you can also see the bands of a typical Landsat um, 8 image in gray. So within these bands, we receive one value of reflected energy based on that object. So that brings us to spectral resolution, which is the ability of a sensor to define wavelength intervals or ranges. When we use the word band, we are referencing a wavelength range and how the satellite is making the distinctions between different ranges. So each band represents a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and if you have reflection of an object at different wavelengths, you can use band math or simple calculations to identify differences. When we have multispectral imagery, likely we have blue, green, red, near infrared, and mid infrared. So with a satellite image, we get one value for each wavelength range for each, each pixel. We can then stack the layers to view the imagery. We can also use the values for different layers at the same location on Earth to identify things like vegetation health. Here you can see a comparison of the bands of Landsat 7, 8 and 9, and Sentinel-2. So for Landsat 8 and 9, for example, those sensors have 11 bands or wavelength ranges where data are collected. The band number and the corresponding portion of the electromagnetic spectrum are shown here. Like band 2 is blue, Band 3 is green, band 4 is red, and so on. The gray parts of this figure are called the atmospheric windows, where the satellite can actually collect the reflected energy from the ground. So now that we understand what types of information are being collected, now let's talk more specifically about how to use that information through spectral indices. As we have discussed, multispectral remotely sensed imagery contains a combination of bands that creates a composite image that can be used for interpretation and analysis. With multispectral imagery, the individual bands in the band composite 
can be transformed to gain certain features and patterns or to make things stand out better. This is done with a mathematical equation applied to each spectral band of an image for each pixel. Simple ratios between the reflectance of the land surface can be used to highlight representations of ground objects like vegetation. The benefit of these band ratios is that they are often simple, broadly applicable across different types of imagery, and they reduce the effects of the atmosphere, the instrument noise, and the sun angle. These indices can also allow for consistent estimates of things like vegetation health across space and time. There are more than 100 vegetation indices that have been derived from multispectral imagery. So there are many applications of spectral indices, and throughout this series, we'll give you an example of some. Um, just to name a few, we've mentioned vegetation health. Um, these can also be used for burned area mapping and fire severity. Um, we could look at things like water content, biophysical parameters, geologic mapping, and much more. So as we discussed today, NDVI specifically is one of the most widely used vegetation indices in the world and has been used as a state of vegetation over many different spatial and temporal resolutions. Vegetation health is generally a measure of the amount of the reflected near-infrared light, with healthier vegetation reflecting more near-infrared light than unhealthy vegetation. So we can use NDVI to monitor things like crop health, phenology, it can be a, used as a drought indicator, it can help us better understand leaf area index, and even carbon monitoring. Here are the spectral indices that we will cover over the course of this training series. So today, we're really focusing on NDVI. Um, in the next session, we'll be focused on those aquatic indices that are most commonly used. And then in part three, we'll come back to our land indices and talk a little bit more in depth about some of these other, um, maybe less commonly used, but still broadly applicable uh, land-based indices. So today, we'll focus on the NDVI. So what is NDVI? As you recall, when sunlight strikes plant leaves in the chlorophyll, in those, the chlorophyll in those leaves strongly absorbs the blue and the red. And the cell structure of the leaves reflects green and strongly reflects near-infrared light. This is portrayed in the graphic along the top. So the two key wavelengths for NDVI are the red the portion that is absorbed primarily by healthy vegetation, and then the near infrared, the portion that is highly reflected. NDVI is the relationship between the red and the near infrared wavelengths. The actual formula is shown here. The values of NDVI for an individual pixel range from negative one to one. Any pixel between negative one and zero means no vegetation, and pixels that have values closer to one indicate the highest possible density of green leaves. The picture here on the right shows that healthy green vegetation absorbs most of the visible light and only 8% is reflected. Unhealthy sparse or senescing vegetation reflects more visible light and less near infrared light. So you can see the difference in the resulting NDVI values in the, in the image here. So the green vegetation has a value, value a little closer to one. In this example, it's 0.72, while the brown vegetation has a value a little closer to zero, here it's 0.14. Plant phenology is the annual dynamic of vegetation greenness, and it can also be tracked using vegetation indices. In the graph on the top, you can see the progression of vegetation dynamics as the seasons change. In North America, early in the year, which, which is winter, um, there are no leaves on the trees, resulting in low NDVI values. When spring arrives, the vegetation greens up and NDVI increases until it peaks in the summer. Then vegetation senesces and the plants lose their leaves and the NDVI decline. And you can see this major difference in um, the North American image, images on the bottom. And this is really what we showed with that first beautiful visualization of our breathing earth and the changes in NDVI over the course of the year. 
NDVI anomalies are often used to show current vegetation patterns relative to long-term averages. This can be calculated by subtracting the long-term mean from the current value and is often done on a monthly basis. For example, if the anomaly is negative, this indicates that vegetation is less green than normal, which may be indicative of drought-like conditions. In the example shown here, you can see NDVI anomalies in the southwestern U.S., which experienced severe drought in the early 2000s. The brown areas indicate a decrease in greenness for 2000 to 2003 compared to a long-term average. When calculating NDVI using Landsat, this figure can be used as a reference to remember which bands to use, band four or the red band, and band five or the near-infrared band for Landsats eight and nine. And this is a little different for um, Landsat seven. So for Landsat seven, it's bands three and four. For Sentinel two, we often use bands four and eight for the NDVI calculation shown here. So to give you a sense of how this calculation looks on the ground, imagine that each of these gray squares is a pixel, and we are interested in doing NDVI calculation for one of the pixels. And let's just say we want to look at this one on the bottom right. The near infrared value for this pixel is 0 0.1144, and the red value it, for this pixel is 0 0.0344. Given those values, we will take the near infrared value minus the red and then divide that by the near infrared value plus the red value. And we get an NDVI value of 0.538. And this is indicating healthy vegetation. So you can apply the same calculation for an entire image using the near infrared and red values for each individual pixel, pixel and generate an entire new NDVI layer. So this shows you a bit more visually of how those near infrared and red values are used on a pixel by pixel basis to examine NDVI over a large region by applying that same calculation across each pixel. Now to give you an example of an application of NDVI, I wanted to briefly show you a project that was conducted by NASA Develop. And this is a workforce development program where teams of interns work with partner agencies to solve some environmental monitoring or mapping issue. In this example, a team from NASA Goddard um, had um, advisors here from Argentina, and they were really interested in early harvest information that helps guide agricultural commodity assessments in Argentina and provide valuable planning information to identify potentially food insecure region, regions, they could use, be used to anticipate transportation and storage demand, predict price fluctuations, and, and project commodity trends. However, crop yield estimates are currently subjective based on interviews with qualified informants. So in partnership with the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange, um, the team used a variety of NASA Earth observations and Google Earth Engine to monitor vegetation growth. So the first component of this work was to produce spatial and temporal maps of, of temperature, precipitation, soil moisture, and the NDVI to allow users to visualize the influence of the region's climate and weather on the vegetation. Following that part of the project, the team developed an autoregressive model to predict NDVI several months in advance. Lastly, the team created a linear regression model of crop yield and NDVI for soybeans, corn, and wheat, and input the forecasted NDVI to generate a predicted crop yield output. The NDVI forecasting model produced accurate predictions at two, four, and six months lead time when examining the most recent growing season. In the crop yield model, soybeans exhibited moderately strong correlation and wheat, and wheat had a consistent wheat correlation, and cord, corn varied from weak to strong. Um, but this information was vital for monitoring vegetation growth and identifying areas of high growth and allocating resources to areas of lower growth to maximize crop yields. 
So just one result from that project, this slide shows an example of the NDVI vegetation index variable from MODIS. Um, from July 2020 to June 2021, the mean monthly mean NDVI was measured. And the green line on the plot shows the averages for this season. And then the gray shows the 10 year average um, for NDVI values throughout this zone. The map on the right shows the maximum NDVI values from July 20th to June 2021. And this is shown as a maximum value rather than an average value to provide a visual for the most active growing regions. Um, and then after the, this first por portion of the work, the, the team conducted the NDVI portion of the forecasting. And if you'd like to learn anything else about this project, there's a link to the um, project information here as well. But it gives you at least an example of how the NDVI could really be useful in forecasting and modeling and looking at vegetation health as it may pertain to things like crops. So in this final portion of the session, I wanted to briefly highlight a few commonly used NDVI products. Standard NDVI and EVI products are available from MODIS data and are generated every 16 days at 250 meters spatial, spatial resolution. The algorithm chooses the best available pixel from all the acquisitions in a 16 day period. The criteria is used to um, limit clouds, low view angle, and um, the highest NDVI EVI value. The collections names are listed here and the data are available by the Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center or LPDAC and a variety of other places like um, Earth Data Search and OpenDAT. VIRS has similar vegetation indices such as NDVI, EVI, and a newer EVI2 algorithm um, where the best pixel is selected over a 16-day acquisition period at 500 meter resolution. And the VIRS products are designed in a very similar way as the, the MODIS products and um, are available in similar places as well. There are also Landsat NDVI products available, and these are upon request from the USGS Earth Resources and Observation and Science Center. Um, and there will also be a few new products available via the Satellite Needs Working Group, which I will mention briefly as well. There is also this unique product of vegetation index and phenology, and these are global data sets that were created using AVHRR and MODIS data. And this was developed to provide consistent measurements of NDVI and EVI over 30 years. And this is produced in collaboration with the University of Arizona. In session three, my colleague Brittany will provide a review of some of the exciting new products available from the Satellite Needs Working Group. So I just wanted to mention this here. Um, they've identified um, new data products that will be available very soon. And we'll talk about um, a lot of those products again in session three. So now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Brittany, who will provide a Google Earth e Engine demonstration of NDVI calculations. So over to you, Brittany. Thank you, Amber. Yeah, uh, here in Google Earth Engine today, we will be calculating uh, the NDVI with a couple different data sets. We'll be using both Landsat 9 and Sentinel-2 for the calculation. And we're also going to explore some pre-made, readily available NDVI products from Veers and Terramotus. So with that being said, we can just dive in and get started. So here at the start of the script, uh, we are just creating a title for the map window. I'm looking here at line 18. We're just creating the variable title. And we're just you know creating that title, part one, exploring NDVI. We have the font weight, the font size, and then the position on the map. And then here on line 25, we're just adding that title to our map. Just a quick little code just to remind us what we're doing here in this section that I'm highlighting right here down below. So we've added that just to get us started. And now moving into the more sciencey aspect, part one, calculating NDVI over the Real de Salinas in Mexico with Landsat 9. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is here on line 32, and we are creating this region of interest, also known as an ROI. And so this variable, which we've called ROI underscore one, is our first geometry. And so that geometry here down below, it's this big blue square that I drew ahead of time. And this is just over the real disalinas that we're working with. Um, so I drew that, and that's what we're going to be looking at in this first section. But if you are working with this data set later and you want to change this region of interest, instead of going all throughout the code and changing it over and over again, you can just change it from geometry to whatever your own geometry, your own asset, whatever, and it should continue throughout the code under ROI underscore one. You can change this, this region of interest without too much trouble throughout your code if you'd like to change that at another time. But for now, we just have our region of interest one, and it's this, this nice big blue square that we drew over the real disalinas. All right, so getting into the functions, uh, creating scale factors and cloud masking for Landsat 9, we're going to start on line 36 here by creating a function that applies a scale factor to our imagery. Here on line 35, I have a nice link that sort of goes into what scale factors are and why you want to use them with Landsat Level 2 Science products. Um, basically, the calculations are multiplying by this value and adding by this value for the different bands. So I use this function to apply those scale factors, and this function is created, and we're going to use it later in our code. And we're going to create another function to mask out clouds from our Landsat 9 data here on line 44. And the name of this function is mask L9FR for lens at nine surface reflectance. And here we are using the QA pixel band, Landsat 9's pixel quality assessment band, and we are selecting cloud and cloud shadow pixels, and we are setting them to zero, indicating clear conditions. So this function here just takes any pixel that's potentially a cloud or a cloud shadow and it's removing them from our image collection. So that way we have nice cloud-free data that we're working with for all of our different calculations. So here we've just created these functions so far. We haven't applied them yet. So here we're actually using the functions and loading our image collection itself on line 59. And that's var variable L9 Landsat 9. So we are loading this Landsat 9 imagery right here. And I can even just copy this specific little title for it. And if I paste it up here and click on it, here we have all this different information from the Google Earth Engine data set, data collection, all about Landsat 9 imagery. We have a nice description. We have a nice uh sort of chart here all about the different bands. We have all of its image properties, and we're going to be referring back to this band section in a second when we start to calculate the NDVI. But I just wanted to let you know that this is something that's available that you can always check out and read more about each of the data sets that we're using throughout the training today and the rest of the, the training itself. So here, so far we've just loaded it, and then on Line 60, we are filtering by the date for this whole Landsat image collection. We've just selected all of July 2022. And here on line 61, we are using dot filter bounds to filter by that region of interest boundary, that geometry that we talked about earlier, which is filtering by that region. And here on line 62 and 63 with dot map, we are applying those scale factor and cloud mask functions that we created. So even though we created them up above on these lines, we are applying them to our image collection itself using dot map on line 62 and 63. And here on line 64, we are taking the median values for all of those pixels and we are going from an image collection to a nice image that we're going to use on our map later. So we're just taking the median of all those values. All right, so here on line 66, we are using that nice RO1, ROI underscore one variable, and we are clipping our imagery specifically to the geometry. So we filtered by it before, but now we are specifically filtering it to, or sorry, we are specifically clipping it to this nice square area of interest that we're going to be exploring in a minute here. 
And so we are just clipping it using L9 dot clip, this dot clip function, and we're naming it RDS for Real de Salinas. All right, so here, the exciting part here uh, on line 71, we are going to be calculating NDVI over our region of interest. So we have that equation, the formula for NDVI itself here on line 70. And the equation, in case you need a refresher, is near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red. So uh, how do you know which are the correct bands for near infrared and red on the satellite and sensor that you're working with? You can do that here in Google Earth Engine by just looking at that band tab, looking at this big chart. So here you can see that they all have different names, blue, green, there we go. Our first uh, red band here, that's band four, also known as SR underscore B4. So that's one of the bands that we're going to be working with. And then the near infrared band is the following one, band five, which goes by the name SR underscore band five. So surface reflectance band five and surface reflectance band four. And I've noted that here on line 71, just as a reminder, SR B5 is near infrared and SR underscore B4 is the red band for Landsat 9 specifically. So to calculate the NDVI here on line 72, we are creating the variable called L9 NDVI, Landsat 9 NDVI, and we're using that RDS, that you know clipped area of interest, our region of interest with the Landsat 9 imagery. And we're using this function here that normalized difference. So that's um, that might be new here. So to explore that, I'm going to open up the docs tab and I'm going to type in normalized difference. And you can see right here, we're working on an image. So it's ee.image. And you can see it's normalized difference. And here it's all the information about it. And you can see it computes the normalized difference between two bands. And then the normalized difference is computed as, and here you can say first band minus second divided by that first band plus the second. And so this equation here perfectly matches the NDVI formula here with the near infrared minus the red divided by the near infrared plus the red, the first minus the second divided by the first plus the second. So this dot normalized difference function that we're going to be using works for the NDVI calculation. I definitely want everyone here to note that even though uh, this normalized difference function works for NDVI and a couple other formulas and indices that we're working with, not every remote sensing based indices is this exact formula with different bands. A lot of different Remote sensing indices out there are more complicated. They involve more than just two bands. So you can't always use dot normalized difference for any band calculation that you want. So make sure that if you are using just the simple dot normalized difference function here in Google Earth Engine, that the function that you're working with is just the first band minus second band divided by the first band plus the second band. Other than that, um, you can either calculate indices by hand, and there's a lot of different examples for that online. But for today, we are just using normalized difference because that formula does work for NDVI. So that being said, the two bands that we're working with, the near infrared is SRB5, and then the red band is SRB4. So here on line 72, we've calculated NDVI just using that function, which is great. All right, so here on line 75, we are setting the visual parameters. So as we discussed in the presentation, NDVI is on a scale from negative one to one for values, and then we've selected this palette from white to green. So that's what we're going to have down below. Our NDVI is going to be visually from negative one to one, and then from white to green for our color values. And then we are adding it to our map as a layer here on line 78 using L9 NDVI with the visual parameters NDVI viz. And we have named it Landsat 9 NDVI. 
And then here on line 81, we have just used a map dot center object, and then we selected our object L9 and DBI in the zoom layer 12. We did that. So when you run the code, it automatically zooms to this uh, this layer that we created instead of having to zoom in from you know a worldwide view, it zooms right to where we want, which is very helpful. And that is what we have down here as our first layer, this Landsat 9 NDVI. This is what we're looking at, a nice NDVI over the real day salinas. And you can turn on the satellite view if you want, and you can sort of change the opacity of this layer, and you can see how the difference in vegetation changes with the different types of uh, difference in vegetation in the NDVI changes with the difference in land cover and the difference in vegetation over this area. You can see that the water is a very light color because it's not vegetation. And you can see like the you know, very thick vegetation is a nice dark green. You can see the different mangroves and whatnot are a different color green. You can really zoom in and see the differences here. Um, it's all very interesting and something fun to explore. Right. So something that we also added here on line 84 is we are printing the minimum and maximum NDVI values in our region of interest. So earlier we were talking about how the NDVI itself is usually on a scale from negative one to one. However, most regions of interest do not reach the full range of negative one to one for the values in that area. Most are usually uh, close or there's a big difference in negative one to one and they don't meet those that full range. So what we're doing here on line 84 is we are using the reducer min max over our geometry, and we are just printing what the min and max NDVI values are. And we're just printing that with line 91. And so that here on our console tab, that shows the actual min and max values. So this uh, in the real Salinas geometry that we have, their region of interest, the minimum and maximum values are not ne negative one to one, but they're actually negative 0 0.996 and 0 0.997. So if you want, you can always sort of, I'm just gonna copy and paste the first couple lines here on line 75, where we set the visual parameters. I'm gonna replace the minimum with the printed minimum here. I'm gonna replace the maximum to the actual maximum here. So instead of negative one and one, we have the min and max from our region itself, and it's very close to negative one and one for sure. Um, however, other areas of interest that we're going to be working with are not on that scale of negative one to one, and you'll see a much larger difference in um, the, the color palette and the variability between the greens and the whites in your region of interest below. So right now, now that it's loaded from zero point, negative 0 0.999 and the maximum of 0 0.997. There's a subtle difference um, in how things look, but you'll definitely see more of a difference as we continue to do that with our other regions of interest, both today and next week and the week after with the training. But that's it for our first region of interest. So moving on to part two, we are going to be calculating NDVI over Wichita, Kansas with Sentinel-2. So we're moving to a new region of interest and we're moving to a new uh, satellite and sensor, which is very exciting. So following a very similar uh, process as we did before, we're going to start by selecting our new region of interest, our new ROI, and that's with our geometry two, just a second geometry that I've drawn over Wichita, Kansas. Again, if you want to change your geometry on your own at another time, you would do that right here with geometry two on this line 97. But from there, working with a new data set means that we're going to be creating a new cloud mask. So we're going to start here on line 105 by creating the function mask S2 clouds. 
So we're going to start by selecting the QA60 band from Sentinel-2. And similar to what we did in Landsat 9, we are selecting the cloud and the Cirrus um, bit masks, and we are selecting or setting them to zero. Just as before with our cloud mask, we want clear conditions. We don't want any pixels that could be cloud-based. We want very cloud-free imagery for all the calculations and visualizations that we're going to be creating. So this cloud masking function here on line 105 has been created. And then we are using it uh, starting on line 120, where we load the Sentinel-2 data and we start filtering and things like that. So we start with the variable S2, Sentinel-2. And so let me just copy this information about Sentinel-2. And I'll just paste that. And it's this first section here, this first one, top one that comes up. So here in the description, it's all this information about Sentinel-2, all of the different bands that we're going to be working with. Again, we're going to refer back to this when we're calculating NDVI. There's also lots of uh, information about the image property and everything else. So working with Sentinel-2, we're going to start by filtering the date. Um, again, it's just July 2022. Uh, we're filtering by the bounds. We're filtering by ROI2, that second geometry I drew over Wichita, Kansas. That's where we're going to filter to. And then we are filtering out uh, the least cloudy pixels that we have, less than 20% cloudy. And then from there, applying our cloud mask that we created above with dot, uh, dot map with mask S2 clouds, that function we created here on line 105. And then similar as we did in our last section, we're using the median of those values to make an image of our study area. All right. So here on line 129, we are using that variable ROI2 to clip our Landsat 9 imagery we selected above to the geometry that we drew over Kansas. And we are just naming that variable Kansas, just a nice you know, cookie cutter clip of the geometry that we drew over Kansas, and that's what we're selecting. And then starting here, we will be calculating that NDVI over Kansas. So the NDVI formula is the same as before, near infrared minus red, and then it is divided by near infrared plus red. So what are the near infrared and red bands on Sentinel? Selecting this area here and going to the band section, we can see that the red band on Sentinel uh, 2 is band 4, so, and it's just known as B4. And then the near infrared on Sentinel-2, that band is band 8, also known as B8. So, and I noted that here, B8 is the near infrared band and B4 is the red band. And we are calculating that NDVI right on line 134 with the variable S2 NDVI. We are just calculating via the dot normalized difference function enlisting band 8 and band 4 as our near infrared and red bands for the NDVF. And here we are setting those visual parameters on line 137, the negative 1 to 1 values, and then the palette of white and green. We're going to change those later, but for now we're just going to start with the negative 1 to 1 for our total area of interest. And then we are adding that map uh, to our layer as S2 NDVI, we're applying those visual parameters and we are naming it Sentinel-2 NDVI. And here on line 134, um, we are changing the center object for our code. So previously we have been looking at 3L de Salinas, but now I want you to go to line 143, sorry, and 143, and we're going to get rid of those two slash marks that you see at the beginning of the code. So I want to make sure that when we run the code to see Wichita, Kansas, that on line 143, that map dot center object is, you know, this colorful sort of purple color. You can see everything because if you have the slashes in front of it and it's all green, that means it's commented out. So that code won't run. And we need to be able to run this line 143. So that way our map down below here will 
sort of zoom to Wichita, Kansas, and we can look at it. So once line 143 is able to run, meaning if there's no slash marks at the beginning of it or anything, and it's nice and, you know, got a little bit of color, we're going to hit run. And so now our code should be looking at a bunch of agriculture over Wichita, Kansas. And so now we can look at that. So I'll hit even change it to the satellite so you can see the different types of vegetation. Here you can see Wichita right there in the sort of lighter green colors because there's not as much vegetation. And then you can see this reservoir here. It's a very light color because it's just water. And then you can see all the different types of agriculture and farmland and all the different values here. Lots of vibrant dark and light greens and you can even see the river here in the lighter color so that's all really cool and fun to explore um, but similar as we did uh, with the lens at nine imagery we printed the min and the max because the values themselves probably don't range from negative one to one and in our console here where we printed it you can see the values actually range from the minimum value of the ndvi over wichita kansas is negative 0 0.397 and the maximum value is 0 0.727. So we're gonna go back up to line 137 here where we set the visual parameters. And I'm going to change the minimum from negative one to the true minimum value in our region. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the max. I'm just gonna take the first three numbers after the decimal point but so I'm going to hit run again and you're going to see that the visualization is going to be less of a uniform green and there's going to be a little more variation between the colors in our palette so I hit run and so yeah now if you look you can see that the reservoir is a little bit lighter you can see a lot more variation here in the vegetation than you could before because we just changed the min and the max to more accurately reflect the min and max values uh, in our palette. So you can see, I think there's a, a very visual difference here. And you're gonna see um, a very big difference in the different demonstrations we do in the next couple of weeks, but make sure that when you do run your NDVI that your visualizations match the, the min and max for your study area rather than just negative one to one. So I find that all very exciting and I hope you do too. And another thing we're going to explore in this last section here is the prepared NDVI data sets. So we're going to start with Terramotus and this is a 16 day average and it's at 250 meter resolution. So right now here below at Wichita, Kansas, this is, I believe, a 20 meter resolution. But when we add to the Terramotus information, we'll see what 250 meters looks like. And I can even here on line 159, copy the Terramotus data set and paste it up here. And we can look at this. There's a nice user's guide. There's um, documents that you can read about. And here you can see the bands. And again, we're not looking at the near infrared and red bands. We're just looking at the NDVI band because that's already been calculated for us, which is very, very handy. So we're going to close that. And you can see here, instead of having to filter out clouds and apply scale factors and calculate the NDVI ourselves, all we have to do for this data set is load it, filter it to the dates that we want, and select that NDVI band. And then from there, you're just setting those visual parameters and adding it to our map here on line 171. So I will turn on that layer. It's known as Terramotus NDVI. And here you can see the difference between the spatial resolution. You can see this is Kansas uh, at a 20 meter resolution, and this is it at a 250 meter resolution. However, it had a lot less uh, calculation on our end, it's ready made, even if the resolution's a little bit more difficult. But it is great because it's worldwide coverage for that data set. So if you want to do less sort of calculation on your end and you just want to work with these pre made data sets, Terramotus is a great option.
And then we also have the Veers product here starting on line 173. And this is another 16 day data set at 500 meter resolution. And so I can just copy this here and then paste it up top. And so this is our 16 day indices. We have a lot of nice information, some links to different user guides in the website. And similar to before, we're not working with the red band and whatnot. We're just working with the NDVI band because it's already been calculated. So we are just loading that data set, filtering by the dates, selecting that NDVI band, and then just taking the median values. And then from here, we're selecting those visual parameters and applying it to our map or adding it to our map here on line 187. And let me just zoom into Wichita, Kansas again, just to see the difference. So now I'll turn on the Veers NDVI layer, and this is it at 500 meter resolution. You can see the difference in the values. So this is the Veers NDVI. This is the Terramotus NDVI. And then this is the Sentinel-2 NDVI. But similar as before, a lot less calculation on us, our, the user, our end of things. And you can see a lot of the different changes in the vegetation with that worldwide coverage, which is very handy. All right. And that is the end of this script right now. So um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed this demonstration. You were able to use it. And with that being said, I think we can go back to the presentation. All right. Thank you, Brittany, so much for that great demonstration. And we, as Brittany mentioned, we have the code available for anyone who wants to test some of these out on their own as well. So to summarize for today, every surface on Earth reflects and absorbs energy in different ways. Using this information from different bands of a satellite image can help us better understand the features on Earth. A spectral index is a mathematical equation that is applied over the various spectral bands of an image per pixel. Simple band ratios that highlight a specific process or property on the land surface. And the NDVI is the most commonly used vegetation index globally, and it's a simple ratio between the near infrared and the red bands. And there are many other spectral indices that can be used for aquatic and land applications, so please stay tuned. And then looking ahead at next week, um, we will be talking about things like the normalized difference turbidity index, the normalized difference chlorophyll index, and the normalized difference aquatic vegetation index. As a reminder, we will have one homework assignment and that will not be available on the website until November 9th. You will see um, a link to access a Google form on the course website. This will be due on November 20, 23rd. And to receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three webinars and complete the homework by the due date. And those certificates will be sent out about two months after the end of the course. So please reach out to myself or my team with any additional questions. And you can also follow us on Twitter. You can check out the RSET website. And then you can also visit our sister programs, Develop and Severe. So I wanna thank you all so much for your time today. And if we have some time, we will now move into the question and answer portion of the training. Thank you so much. All right, so now we are here in the Q&A portion. Just give us a moment as we move over to the Q&A document. Um, and as we mentioned, um, we've gotten a lot of questions today um, and we won't be able to get to all of them um, during the session, but we will try to go through the majority of these questions and make this document available on the course website um, afterwards. So if your question didn't get answered, um, come back in about a week or two and check the website and, and maybe you'll see your answer on there as well. Um, so we'll, we'll go through a few of these now um, and get to as many as we can. So question one, a really good question. Um, how do spectral indices help with atmospheric conditions, instrument noise, and sun angle? Um, the really great thing about spectral indices is that they're simple ratios between two um, different 
wavelength ranges. And so you're really looking at the, the ratio value through that calculation. You're not necessarily interested in, say, the, the actual values of top of atmosphere or surface re reflectance directly. Um, so long as you are using um, the wavelengths from the same image, that shouldn't create an issue for you in terms of um, the effects of the atmosphere, instrument noise, and sun angle. I will say that um, I recommend using surface reflectance um, if that's available, um, for example, from Landsat um, when doing these calculations, if possible. Question two, would NDVI be a good index for monitoring irrigation areas? Uh, yes, NDVI is one of the most commonly used indices for monitoring vegetation. And as we mentioned and we highlighted throughout this session, that can be done with a variety of sensors. So long as you have a red band and a near infrared band, you can do this calculation. Um, so Landsat Sentinel, for example. Um, and the other great thing is that it can also be done with drone, um, drone imagery or commercial imagery if you um, have both of those bands. So, for example, if you um, are interested in a small irrigated field and you have the ability to fly a drone that has a red band and a near infrared band, um, you're, you're going to get much um, increased spatial resolution on the ground for really identifying um, differences in your crop health across your field. Um, it might be a little challenging with say something like Landsat if, you're, if your field is small. So um, I, I also wanted to mention that another metric that is often used to um, identify things like uh, plant water stress or water use on irrigated fields is evapotranspiration or ET, and that can be derived from Landsat and a variety of models. Okay. Question three, NDVI shows healthy vegetation. Can we categorize or classify the forest based on its NDVI value? Say like primary forest, secondary forest in the tropics. So I would say the NDVI is usually used to identify relative health of vegetation. So it can be used for looking at um, restoration or degradation of forest systems. It's often not used for identifying the type of forest However, there has been some research that has tried to identify general ranges of NDVI values for primary forest versus secondary forest. Um, so you could look into that as well. Um, when doing that kind of analyses, I would really recommend some ground-based information. So um, taking spectral measurements on the ground in these various forests to um, calibrate or to, to check um, what those values, the corresponding values then would look like from the satellite. So um, that's a little bit, uh, I would say, higher um, in terms of the type of analysis that you're doing. I do believe it's possible, but um, it's sort of on the, the edge of the research, I believe. Okay, question three. How can the ranges of NDVI be divided into different classes to assess health and density? At which value does the actual vegetation measurement start and how do the ranges differ in different satellites? So um, the NDVI value is from negative one to one. Negative values are usually things like water, man-made structures, rocks, clouds, snow. Bare soil is usually within 0.1 to 0.2. And then plants always have positive values between 0.2 and 1. Um, and this is really going to vary depending on um, your landscape. So Generally, healthy, dense vegetation should be above 0.5. Sparse vegetation will fall between 0.2 and 0.5. Um, but as I mentioned, it's really important to understand your system. Um, you need to understand the seasonality of the plants um, to really understand how to compare NDVI values in different places and across different times. Um, and I will say that, that we will mention some other um, vegetation indices that are really useful in, say, very dense regions. Um, for example, we'll talk about the enhanced vegetation index. Um, that's really good for dense uh, tropical forests. And then the SAVI is the soil adjusted vegetation index. And that's really good for sparser areas, desert areas. And we'll talk about that during our third um, session of this training series. Um, and in terms of the final question, 
the the rate the ranges will be the same across different satellites because again it's just a ratio so you're always going to be using you know two landsat uh bands or two sentinel bands in your calculation you're never going to say like combine a landsat red with a sentinel to ND or uh, near infrared that's not going to be how you ever do your calculation so the the ranges should be the same um because it's a ratio okay uh next question Question five, does the difference in resolution affect the accuracy when comparing different years? For example, if I compare data from 1987 with a re lower resolution than 2004 um, as a result of the advances in technology. So I, I guess my answer to this is somewhat. <laughs> so it really, again, depends on the landscape, right? So if you, if you have an NDVI value for say a 250 meter resolution image that you know, is further back in time, that's one NDVI value for that really large region um, as compared to say maybe a 30 meter, um, you know, one value for a 30 meter area in more recent um, technology and, and satellites and sensors. Although I will say Landsat has the 30 meter res resolution going back really far. So that's one benefit of using the Landsat data. So it depends on your area. If you have a really heterogeneous landscape, and you are covering an area that is dense forest and more sparse uh, vegetation or bare soil within a 250 meter pixel, then you're, you're going to say have a lower NDVI value than if your entire 250 meter pixel is in a dense forest. So it really, again, depends on the questions you're asking, the landscape you're looking at, and um, you know, what you're trying to do with the NDVI. So, um, so certainly higher spatial resolution is generally um, more useful um, for these types of calculations. Okay, question six. Um, are Landsat 7 NDVI values comparable with Landsat 8 and 9 values despite small differences? So um, they, yes, they are very similar. Um, you can take a look at slide 32 for um, the uh, the actual values. So the um, the red bands are exactly the same. Well, <laughs> very very similar, and the near infrared um, are just a little different. So if you look at slide 32, you can actually see what those values are, but they are comparable across them. Um, again, when you calculate the NDVI, you're going to be doing it with you know, the red and near infrared bands from Landsat 7. And if you do it a, another time, you're going to be using the, you know, bands from Landsat's 8 and 9. But um, if you're comparing across time and you're using Landsat 7 earlier in the record and then Landsat's 8 and 9 later in the record, the NDVI values will be very comparable. Okay, question 7. Is there a significant accuracy improvement when applying normalized difference indices to level two and level um, one images? So I would use the level two images when they are available. Those are just processed at a higher level and generally considered more accurate, um, you know, taking out some of the effects of the, the sensor. Again, it's a ratio, so it, it probably doesn't make that big of a difference, um, but my, uh, my go-to is always using level two images if I can. Okay, so the next question asks about the, let's see, question eight. From which website will I find recent MODIS NDVI data? Um, so if you take a look at slide 40 of um, the slides today, you can see there are a variety of places to obtain those MODIS NDVI and EVI products. Um, you can look at the, I think the easiest place to go as a starting point is Earth Data Search. That um, Earth Data Search has tons of different um, um, satellite imagery available. Um, you can also use things like Appears, which we didn't highlight in a lot of um, depth here. But the great thing about Appears is that you can actually do some analysis prior to downloading imagery. Um, you can select a pixel or you can select a um, geometry and create some um, graphs and analyze those graphs all within the appears interface prior to downloading imagery if that's of interest to you 
And I believe the the Modus NDVI and EVI products are available on Earth Engine too through the um, Earth Engine catalog as well. So um, there are a variety of places that you can go, and it really kind of again depends on what your use for them are, and if you want to do analyses, you know, in the cloud using these um, um, options from some of the the DAX. Um, or if you just want to download the imagery and analyze it yourself in like a QGIS or an ArcGIS, again, it's it's really up to you and how um, how you want to use the data. Um, and then question nine. Um, okay, it sounds like it looks like we're getting to some of the questions about the the, the code. But the short answer to question nine, is it possible to share these scripts of NDVI extraction? It, yes. So the code for the link to the code is on slide 45, I believe. Um, and anyone can access that. It's freely available. Um, you just need to have an Earth Engine account. So you can you can run that script. You can use that script. You can copy and paste that script into your own, modify it for your region of interest. If you are, um, you know, a coder and you're familiar with Earth Engine, then um, go for it. It's available. Okay, question 10. Does everyone use the same cloud masks? Um, maybe I'll pause here and see if my colleague Brittany would like to respond to that because I think she might have um, added some of this text here. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Hear you, thanks. Great, um, yeah. So I assume you mean, do you apply the same cloud masks to different satellite and sensors? And the answer is no. How you mask clouds is specific to the satellite or sensor that you're using, even different versions uh, in the case of Landsat. Um, so, for example, in today, we created a function to mask out clouds in the entire image collection uh, in, well, for each image collection with both Landsat and Sentinel-2. And we did that with Landsat using the QA pixel band, and that's an entire band dedicated to identifying objects in the pixels. So you can mask out things like clouds and water, um, and we just use that band to mask out clouds and cloud shadow and whatnot. And then we do the same thing for Sentinel-2A, but we use the QA60 band. So they are specific to satellite and sensors. Um, I would definitely recommend, you know, looking at literature, um, seeing what the common method is, and of course, reading the, uh, the guides that, you know, USGS releases for Landsat and whatnot to see which band specifically they recommend to use for cloud masking and whatnot. I hope that helps. Great. Thank you, Brittany. Okay, moving on to question 11. Can I use NDVI data and CDL data? I want to extract NDVI according to CDL. Is it possible? I am taking a wild guess here and assuming that this person is talking about the cropland data layer, the CDL, um, and I'm not really familiar with the um, how you can analyze and use those data. I do know that the cropland data layer is available um, for the United States. This provides um, estimates of the crop type over the entire US, um, I believe on a yearly basis, going back to 1997. Um, I'm not sure if you can actually extract any NDVI values from the cropland data layer. My assumption is that it is just the, um, the type crop types available, such as like corn or cotton or rice. Um, I assume that they use NDVI in order to make those classifications and distinctions, um, but this is a USDA product. It's not a NASA product. So um, my suggestion would maybe be to contact um, someone from the USDA who is creating those data sets um, to get a little bit more information about that. Um, and I'll just paste the uh, 
the cropland data layer visualization uh, website here. I'll just put that in the in the document for you as well. I'm assuming they use NDVI, but I'm not sure if that's like a product available. You could you could certainly you know obtain NDVI data from from one of the sources that we mentioned here, or calculate it yourself um, using Earth Engine, and then compare it to the cropland data layer if that's what is of interest. Okay, so the next question. Um, also refers to the Earth Engine tutorial. The question is, in the GE tutorial, since it's level two data, are these bands atmospherically corrected? Do all spectral indices work with atmospherically corrected bands as opposed to top of atmospheric bands? Brittany, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so there are definitely many different times types of like levels of data, atmosphere correction, and it all depends on the, the sensor that you're using and the data product, the uh, imagery that you're using as well. So the ones that we use today, I can provide links to the actual descriptions or you can look at it in Google Earth Engine, but I will leave the link here right in the question that you can refer back to. And you'll be able to see to what extent it's been atmospherically corrected, but the answer essentially is yes for our purposes that we use today it is. Um, and then for spectral indices and the bands being correct, um, you want to make sure that whatever uh, sensor that you're using has the bands that are necessary for the wavelength. So you don't want to be performing like an NDVI over something that doesn't have a red band, for example. Um, and I think Amber mentioned that earlier, talking about like you don't want to mix bands from other satellites and sensors. So just making sure that you match the spectral indices that you plan on using with the sensor that has the correct bands for that formula for that spectral indices. Um, and we'll be going over that in the next two uh, webinars as well, part two and three, where we, you know, go through and check that the the band values are correct with the the different bands that we need for the indices that we'll be calculating. Um, I hope that was helpful, Amber Sativa. If there's anything else you'd like to add in addition to that, please feel free. Yeah, that that's all great, Brittany. Thank you for that reply. Um, and it looks like, so I think we're going to go um, for about three more minutes. I know we're 12 minutes past the, um, the hour here. So thanks to everyone who's stayed on with us. So maybe we will try to answer two more questions um, and then end the session for today. Um, Brittany, do, do you want to go ahead and take question 13 as well? Yeah, sure. So it looks like question 13 is, are the variable names case sensitive in Google Earth Engine min max with the max being capitalized equals min max all lowercase. Um, so for the name of the variable that you create, it is case sensitive or you name a variable. Something like, you know, Landsat 9. And then you rename another variable later in your code. Lands that night again, the code will rewrite itself and the latest version of a variable name will become that variable um, that is specific to Google Earth Engine, if that's what you mean by variable names. I notice you use the example min max, that's not exactly a variable, that's a function within Google Earth Engine, and that is also very case sensitive. So when you use things like uh, different functions like dot, min, max, dot, you know, center, object, dot, whatever. Um, Google Earth Engine does follow the sort of, you know, language of the first word in that function, or the first part of that function being lowercase and then the second word being uppercase. So you'll see a lot of the time in Google Earth Engine, when you use functions, it typically follows this sort of same pattern of like first sentence being lowercase, second sentence having an uppercase first letter. Um, and that is common to the, the coding language itself. If you're in the Google Earth Engine 
interface and you go to the documentation tab, it should be on the upper left, that shows you all of Google Earth Engine's functions, a nice description. I think we looked at it today using dot normalize difference. So when you're coding, Google Earth Engine will sometimes tell you if a function doesn't exist, and sometimes it's just because of situations like forgetting to capitalize the, the second word. So I would make sure that when you're coding, you know, use the documentation tab, look at how exactly they want each of the letters to be capitalized or uncapitalized, and that you are using the, the function that you hope you're using. Thanks, Brittany, appreciate that. Um, so we'll go ahead and answer this final question, question 14, um, and then we'll end for today, but we'll try to get to some of your other questions that have been put in the, the document as well. Um, this is a really good question. Um, the question is, I'd love to be able to fill in a form about code parameters in Earth Engine. I wish there was a non-code interface. Um, so we're not Googlers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe take that, that comment up with, with Google, but I will say that um, there is this uh, cool feature or application called GE Map. Um, and there is still some coding that you have to do, but from my understanding is you can create um, sort of point and click functionality that sits on top of the Earth Engine interface um, to run some types of functions. So I've put in a link there um, that you might wanna check out. Uh, Brittany, I don't know if you've ever used this. I've never actually used it, but I've seen some presentations and um, uh, uh, some tutorials on it. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that there are other tools out there um, like Climate Engine, and um, the, these tools are sort of APIs that are built on top of Earth Engine that um, are also point and click calculations. Um, Climate Engine has a lot of the Landsat data, has NDVI, has a lot of indices in there. It's globally available. You can go in and point and click and do some analyses there. Um, and then um, I think Fiona, uh, Gregory in the chat had uh, put in another option for some non code um, earth engine functionality. So I know this is a great community and I'm sure many of you use earth engine um, for a lot of these functions. So um, yeah, help each other out and <laughs> provide those resources where we don't know of them or they're, they're not available. Um, Brittany, is there anything else you want to add to in response to question 14? Um, no, I would just say that I've heard a lot about GEE Map. The creator of it uh, also has a YouTube channel where they post a lot of different uh, tutorials and their own training. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Brittany and my my other RSET colleagues on the back end here who are, you know, making the show run uh, smoothly for us. Uh, we really appreciate all this work. Um, as I mentioned, we will um, continue to review these questions you all have posed here, um, do our best to answer them, and we'll be posting the Q&A um, online within about a week or so. You can come back to that. Similarly, for the recordings, check back and, you know, give us a few days, give us a week or so, um, and those will all be made available for you to watch um, prior, you know, um, coming back to certain things that you might have had questions on, things like that. Um, and do please join us for the next two sessions. So um, next week at the same time, we are going to be reviewing um, aquatic indices. Um, my colleague Juan Torres Perez um, will be giving that lecture and then Brittany will be walking us through another Earth Engine demonstration. Um, so do please join us again for, for next week and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.